Greetings students and welcome back to my lecture series on Calculus of Variations. In this lecture we're going to solve the Brachistochrone problem. Brachistochrone in Greek means short time, but in variational calculus it means a path between two points A and B which minimizes the time taken by a particle falling from A to B under the influence of gravity. So let's make a quick diagram to show what we're dealing with when it comes to solving the Brachistochrone problem. I'm going to draw two points A and B. A label A is x1, y1 and B is x2, y2. There's also a gravitational field in the vertical direction acting downwards. Now before we actually solve any equations, I want to give you some intuition of what a brachistochrone would look like. You probably know from basic physics that time is just distance divided by speed. So if we want to find a brachistochrone that effectively minimizes the time of travel, one option is to minimize the distance of travel and say that our brachistochrone is just a straight line. But that doesn't actually work because it's better to have a steep vertical drop at the beginning. This steep drop allows the particle to obtain a large velocity early on during its travel, so that for the remainder of the trajectory the particle covers most of the horizontal distance at this high velocity. Just to repeat, the steeper the drop earlier on, the greater the velocity that our particle reaches earlier on. In contrast, if the trajectory were flatter earlier on, then we would be forcing the particle to cover most of the horizontal distance at a low velocity. Since gravity cannot accelerate the particle horizontally, it can only accelerate it downwards. The straight line is still relatively flat at the start, which is why it's not our brachistochrone because the speed, the denominator of time, is relatively small. But even this steeper curve isn't quite the path of minimum time because although it maximizes speed, the distance along this path is a little too long. And that's why the actual brachistochrone is an intermediate between the minimum distance path and the maximum speed path. So something like this. So ultimately the brachistochrone curve is formulated using a combination of minimizing the distance and maximizing the speed instead of say just minimizing the distance with a straight line or just maximizing the speed with a steep curve. Hopefully this explanation of the intuition makes sense. Anyway, let's begin by stating the brachistochrone problem. We have our two points A and B. They're separated by a horizontal distance that I'll call L and a vertical distance that I'll call H. I'll label A as 0 comma H and B as L comma 0, just to keep things simple. There's also a gravitational force acting vertically downwards. Now our goal here is to find the path connecting A and B which minimizes the time traveled by a particle going from A to B under the influence of this gravitational field. The first thing we're going to do is write down the quantity we'd like to minimize. In other words, we're going to write down the total time taken from A to B. But this is just the element of time dt integrated from A to B dt is just the element of distance ds divided by the velocity of the particle v, which is in general a function of both x and y. We already know from the Pythagorean theorem that ds is just the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. If we take out the dx, then we'll see that the distance element ds is just the square root of 1 plus dy by dx squared times dx. But what about the velocity? Well, as the particle goes from point A to point B, the gravitational potential energy gets converted to kinetic energy. So what we can do to find the velocity is use the conservation of energy. Of course, we're assuming that there's no dissipation into heat. Now, initially the particle isn't moving, so it has gravitational potential energy given by its mass m times g times the initial height h. Once the particle is at some other height, y, say, the potential energy becomes mgy and the difference is converted to kinetic energy, half mv squared. So after simplifying this energy conservation equation and isolating for the velocity, we'll find that v is just the square root of 2g times h minus y. We're going to take this expression for ds and this expression for v and plug them into our time integral, our functional. Once we do that, here's what we'll end up with. Again, the purpose of the brachistochrone problem is to find the function y of x such that this functional t is minimized. 
And in order to minimize t, we first need to determine the function y of x, which makes t stationary. But how do we do that? How do we make t stationary? That's right, we solve the Euler-Lagrange equation, which we derived in the previous video. Links in the description. Just to give some context, recall that if I had this functional i, which involved an integral from x1 to x2 of some capital F of x, y, and y prime, then the function y, which makes the functional i stationary, can be found by this differential equation, the Euler-Lagrange equation. So all we have to do to make this time functional stationary is apply the Euler-Lagrange equation to our brachistochrone problem. But in this case, notice that our capital F is just the square root of 1 plus y prime squared over 2g times h minus y. There's no independent variable in the integrand, there's no x. And if you remember my video on the Beltrami identity, you know that when the integrand doesn't explicitly depend on the independent variable x, you can use a special case of the Euler-Lagrange equation, which is the Beltrami identity. And recall that the Beltrami identity is given by capital F minus y prime times the partial of f with respect to y prime equals some constant of integration c. This is what we use when our capital F does not explicitly depend on the independent variable, which happens to be the case here. So let's go ahead and plug everything in. And after taking the partial of capital F with respect to y prime and simplifying, here's what we'll end up with. The square root of 1 plus y prime squared over 2gh minus y minus y prime squared over the square root of 1 plus y prime squared times 2gh minus y equals c. We can go ahead and move the 2gh minus y term to the right by multiplying it on both sides. And after that, we can also multiply both sides by the square root of 1 plus y prime squared. These y prime squares just cancel, and we'll be left with a lone 1 on the left. We can now eliminate the square root by squaring the equation, and this is what we'll get. 2g is just a constant, so if we move the 2g and the c square to the other side, the resulting lump of constants will be another constant that I'll call c1. Let's now isolate y prime. We'll start by partially expanding out the left, moving the h minus y to the right, dividing both sides by h minus y, and then taking the square root. The resulting differential equation happens to also be separable, so we're going to separate out the y and the x. We'll move all the y terms to this side and shift the dx to the other side. And then we're going to integrate both sides. When we integrate dx, we'll just have x. But when we integrate the right-hand side, things are a lot tougher. It's still manageable, though. You just have to use trig substitutions. What we're going to do with a trig substitution is let y equal h minus c1 times sine squared of theta over 2. So effectively, we're changing variables from y to theta. In that case, dy is just negative c1 times sine of theta over 2 times cosine of theta over 2 d theta. If we plug this into the integral, here's what we'll get. Now the c1s in the square root cancel, and we can also take this lone c1 outside the integral. The square root of sine squared is just sine, and the square root of 1 minus sine squared is just cosine, in which case we end up with x equals negative c1 times the integral of sine theta over 2 over cosine theta over 2 times sine theta over 2 times cosine theta over 2 d theta. The cosines cancel, and we'll end up with just the integral of sine squared. But using trig identities, we can also write sine squared theta over 2 as just half of 1 minus cosine theta. This integral is now fairly simple to deal with, because we'll end up with x equals k1 over 2 times theta minus sine theta plus k2, where I've replaced the negative c1 by the k1. Now in this case, it's rather difficult to express x in terms of just y. So instead of getting a y of x path, we'll just leave our x and y in terms of the parameter theta, and we'll get two parametric equations for our brachistochrone curve. Let's now apply our boundary condition, starting with point A. We know that when y equals h, x equals 0, and this corresponds to the parameter theta equals 0. And at theta equals 0, x is 0, which means that k2 is also 0. For the second boundary condition for point B, we know that at x equals L, y is 0. We don't exactly know which theta this corresponds to a priori, so I'll label that unknown theta as theta sub L. 
In this case, we end up with a system of two nonlinear equations involving k1 and theta l. It's rather difficult to solve them analytically, but if you're interested in coming up with a numerical solution, I encourage you to go right ahead. The end result is that you'll get k1 in terms of the known constants h and l. Anyway, so these parametric equations that I ended up with, with my x equal to k1 over 2 times theta minus sine theta, and my y equal to h plus k1 over 2 times 1 minus cosine theta, these parametric equations coincidentally happen to represent a cycloid. So we've shown that the function which makes the time functional stationary is a segment on a cycloid. But how do we prove that it makes the time functional minimum? How do we find the nature of the stationary function? Well, typically we used advanced techniques like the second variation, which is like the calculus of variations analog of the second derivative. But in this case, I won't get too rigorous, so finding the stationary function of the time functional should be enough. We'll just say without proof that our stationary cycloid makes our time functional minimum, at least for the time being. So in conclusion, the brachistochrone, the path of shortest time for a particle falling in gravity, the brachistochrone is just a segment on a cycloid. It is this path which minimizes the time taken by the particle to fall under gravity from a point A to another point B that isn't just directly below A. Now before I end the video, I should mention that normally when you look around for solutions to the brachistochrone problem, this H that shows up in the Y equation isn't there. That's because most people like to center their coordinates, so instead of starting at 0, H, they start at 0, 0. Personally though, I like starting at 0, H because I'm the type of person who would rather fall from the sky to the ground than fall from the ground down to hell if you know what I mean. Anyway, that should do it for the lecture. I'd just like to finish off by thanking my patrons Jacob Soares, Yenyo Pal, and Jennifer Heffman for donating at the $5 level or higher to my Patreon. If you would like to become a patron, I put a link to my Patreon account in the description and you can support me there if you wish. So that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.